Your Majesty, your new security force needs direction. Take this. Sir, this is a handkerchief. The more tears you wipe away with that, the more faithfully you will serve my aims. King in the castle. Hello, my name is Jack, and on this channel we explore the history and methods of secret police forces. Today we are going to see how the Tsar's secret police were brutal, innovative, and corrupt as hell. In 1572, Tartar forces set fire to Moscow. Tsar Ivan the Terrible disbanded the bloodthirsty Oprichniki and integrated the Oprichnina and the Zemshina territories against the invaders. But he murdered one of two sons, Tsarevich Ivan Ivanovich. His other son, Feodor Ivanovich, took the throne in 1584, but suffered from some unspecified mental illness so severe that he was unfit for rule. So without clear succession, the Rurik dynasty was left in a state of uncertainty. Feodor was nothing like his father. He spent much of his time praying, visiting churches, and, as a bonus, he did not toss people to hungry bears like Scooby Snacks. However, he was physically weak and considered, quote, feeble-minded, but fortunately Feodor married Irina Gurunova in 1580 prior to becoming Tsar. Irina's brother was an ambitious statesman named Boris Gudunov. Gudunov came from a noble Tatar family, made his career in Ivan the Terrible's court, and managed the state's affairs. Feodor was the CEO serving as a figurehead who took all the credit, and Gudunov was the shadowy chief financial officer doing the real work. Under Gudunov's leadership, Russia achieved military successes, expanded foreign trade, fortified defensive outposts, extended influence into Siberia, and established the head of the Muscovite church as patriarch. Gudunov was put in an awkward position when Feodor died in 1598. He was a competent leader, but not a descendant of Ivan the Terrible, and there was another complicating factor. By one of Ivan's multiple wives, he had a third surviving son, Tsarevich Dmitry Ivanovich, who should have become Tsar after big bro Feodor. Gudunov instead had Dmitry and his family exiled to Urglich because Gudunov clung to power like an 80-year-old member of Congress. In 1591, Dmitry died, but circumstances put the sus in the suspicious. The official investigation claimed Dmitry died due to an epileptic fit while playing with a knife. Now, I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but this smells fishier than Midwest seafood. It probably comes as no surprise that rumors that Gudunov did this were floating around. Even the investigator, future Tsar Vasily Shoisky, wavered on the official narrative. Whatever the case, Gudunov was elected to sit in Russia's captain seat by a council of clergy and gentry called the Zemsky Sobor, or Assembly of Land. What was good enough for them? was Gudunov for Russia. Boris made reforms like allowing students to travel to Europe for education and permitting Lutheran churches to form in the predominantly Orthodox Christian nation. He sought to curb the power of his own in-group, the Boyars. Many of these nobles were exiled, including members of the future ruling Romanov family. Their persecution only fueled resentment towards Gudunov on top of other problems. Seeing the disgruntled elite, Gudunov created a spy network to weed out his opposition. Fortunately for Gudichis, his spies helped fend off a bizarre threat. An imposter claiming to be Tsarevich Dmitry rallied hostile forces against Russia and attempted a march on Moscow in 1604. Gudunov wasn't buying it because I'm guessing Gudunov knew real Dmitry died while learning the finer points of sharp objects. In reality, false Dmitry may have been the son of a Polish king, but he definitely wasn't Ivan's son. Gudunov died in 1605. His 16-year-old son, Feodor II, took the throne, but was removed from power and life just weeks into his reign. In 1606, Russia plunged into the time of troubles, marked by foreign invasions, social upheaval, and civil war. Fake news Dmitry seized power. Less than a year later, a mob of boyars and common folk stormed to the Kremlin. Dmitry's lying ass leapt out a window and busted his leg. Dmitry hobbled to a nearby bathhouse, but the mob seized him. Their hands clawed and tore Dmitry apart. His body was chopped into bits and set on fire. They stuffed his ashes into a cannon and fired them in the direction of Poland, like macabre confetti. Vasily Shoisky took the throne in 1606, but when Polish forces occupied Moscow, Shoisky was captured and sent to Warsaw. Polish forces were expelled from Moscow in 1612. Tsar Mikhail Romanov ascended to the throne in 1613, marking the start of the Romanov dynasty. We won't cover every Tsar from here to the Bolshevik Revolution, just the most relevant to the development of the secret police. Russia appears to have lacked a formal political police force between the Oprichnina and Peter the Great's Preobrzhinsky office, with the exception of Gudunov 
Lvov's spies. The Priobrzezinski office shared duties with a secret chancellery and were led by Theodor Romodanovsky. Their political persecutions were limited to specific individuals and torturous. Victims were first hoisted to dislocate their arms, beaten, and treated like rotisserie chicken. Priobrzezinski was abolished after Peter's death. Tsarina Anna I used the Chancellery of Secret Investigations, which was run by her maybe lover, Duke Ernest Johann von Byron. Their victims were whipped with the knot, and some had their noses slit. Peter III abolished the secret chancellery, and some historians claim he established the secret bureau. Tsar Alexander I wanted to abolish the secret bureau, but he needed them during the Napoleonic Wars. Under the leadership of Alexander I, Russian soldiers and Russian winter repelled Napoleon's Grand Armée back to France. However, these soldiers became acutely aware of Russia's social, political, and economic backwardness compared to Western Europe. Some wanted to import Western ideas to Russia and establish a constitutional government without serfdom. Them. Upon their return from the war, however, Russian veterans faced mistreatment, extensions of military service, and no benefits. Dissatisfaction among the officer class led to an underground movement split into two factions. One in St. Petersburg advocating for a constitutional monarchy, and a more radical group in Moscow led by a man named Colonel Pestel, wanting to assassinate the Tsar and establish a Russian Republic. Both factions saw the perfect opportunity to launch a coup when Alexander I noped out of this reality in November 1825. Nicholas I took the throne and was determined to suppress rebellion, partly due to his childhood experience of witnessing his father, Tsar Paul I's assassination. Nicholas anticipated the coup, attempting negotiations with both groups. Talking failed in a gathering of rebels in St. Petersburg were crushed using artillery, followed by the destruction of the Moscow faction. These groups became known as the Decemberists for staging their revolt in December. The Decemberist revolt marked a turning point because, from then on, the Romanovs made extensive use of secret police forces. Nicholas personally interrogated roughly 150 Decemberist prisoners. He obsessed over the details of their punishments, specifying the type and size of shackles and their tightness. Roughly 3,000 people were arrested in connection with the revolt. Some were sent to Siberia. Nicholas was not content with just eradicating the Decemberists. He sought to actively identify and suppress any resentment towards his rule. He recruited General Alexander Beckendorf, who initially resisted the idea of secret police, but later suggested that such a force should both be feared and respected due to the moral qualities of its leader. However, Nicholas wanted the secret police under his direct control. On July 3rd, 1826, the third section was established as a third appendage of Nicholas's chancellery, composing of several sections or offices that performed different tasks like preparing orders, writing legislation, or managing domestic matters. Beckendorf was appointed as chief of the third section and corpse of the gendarmes. As the story goes, Beckendorf asked Nicholas for a specific mandate for the secret police. Apparently, Nicholas gave him a handkerchief and said, here is all the directive you need. The more tears you wipe away with this, the more faithfully you will serve my aims. The third section was responsible for political security within the civilian population and the military. They were considered higher police, whereas lower police concerned themselves with everyday crimes that didn't threaten the regime. Higher police forces belonged to either the gendarmes or the third section. The gendarmes were more like a military unit, only recruited veterans and donned military uniforms. They investigated currency counterfeiting, kept tabs on religious groups, and enforced censorship like anti-Tsarist media. There were roughly eight to 9,000 members scattered in places like Vladivostok, Baku, and Irkutsk. Agents were employed locally to spy on the more distant and isolated pockets of the population. The pay and special privileges were attractive, but many were deterred by the job's clandestine nature. In contrast, the third section consisted of about 40 agents. On an operational level, they were concentrated in major cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. The third section gained prominence, surpassing other government bodies, including the gendarmes. They monitored foreigners in Russia, planted bugging devices, and intimidated their enemies. In 1833, an American diplomat to Russia reported to then-President Jackson that, quote, you can scarcely hire a servant who isn't an agent of the secret police. Another American diplomat noted that his letters were crudely resealed with different colored wax than the original seal. One English woman noted a large stack of wood piled outside her hotel room window, with a space for a person to crouch and watch. Man, that's just creepy. The third section suppressed the Polish rebellion in 1830, the Novgorod revolt in 1831, and thwarted a plot to assassinate the Tsar. Nicholas I died in March 1855 and was succeeded by his son, Alexander II, and his mighty mutton chops. He introduced legal reforms and rights against arbitrary search and seizure, 
but the government retained extrajudicial law enforcement powers. The third section lost street cred, but remained active due to growing unrest in the empire. Radical opposition groups formed like the Nihilists and another straight up called Hell. A member of Hell attempted to assassinate Alexander II in 1866, but failed. His interrogation included sleep deprivation, starvation, threats of torture, and the worst torment of all, unannounced visits from an Orthodox priest, probably while he was tugging on his... He went insane and ratted on his homies. Then he was executed in 1866. Alexander II focused more on his personal safety and appointed Count Peter Shuvalov and General Fyodor Trepov to powerful police positions. A second assassination attempt occurred in Paris in 1867, and by 1874, the third section seemed incapable of squashing revolutionary activity. Revolutionaries formed clandestine urban networks, adapting to and learning from the third section's methods, and attacks on police officials became more frequent. A radical group called the People's Will attempted to assassinate the Tsar by blowing up one of his trains in Moscow, and the third section found floor maps of the Winter Palace during a police raid. They urged Alexander II to allow a thorough search of the vast palace, but he refused. In response to the attacks, the Tsar appointed Count Mikhail Loris Melikov as chairman of the Supreme Executive Commission in February 1880, which meant control of both the Third Section and the gendarmes. However, the Third Section failed to apprehend the most dangerous and competent revolutionaries. The lack of coordination and disorganization among the police forces hampered all efforts. So, Count Loris Melikov disbanded the Third Section in August 1880 and created the Department of State Police. They continued surveillance on revolutionaries, placing informants inside revolutionary circles. The Department of State Police had some success, but in March 1881, Tsar Alexander II was blown to bits by an explosive hurled at his carriage. The assassin was part of a hit squad led by the notorious Sofia Perovsky. Alexander III succeeded his father and ruled by an iron fist. He was so deeply concerned about the safety of his son, Nicholas II, who saw his grandfather's mangled bloodied body. The Winter Palace performed bell tests and guards searched for potential assassins at random. Alexander III targeted different groups and initiated pogroms against the empire's Jewish population. The Department of State Police turned some revolutionaries into informants, but they weren't even spared execution. Sofia Perovsky was captured and hanged for her activities. And over time, People's Will members were arrested, killed, or living abroad. In 1881, the Tsar invoked broad emergency powers to suppress revolutionary activity, which included a reorganization and renaming of the political police. And the Okrana. Their agents were more experienced and educated than the third sections. However, some agents engaged in lucrative deals with their enemies to outright work against the government's aims. In one case, a police informant grew suspicious of a government minister who was provoking terrorist attacks rather than preventing them from happening. He was lured into an empty apartment building and shot. The Okrana intercepted a letter detailing a plot to assassinate the Tsar and arrested several conspirators, including a student named Alexander Uli. Ulyanov. Discovery of this letter meant death for the conspirators, which radicalized Ulyanov's little brother Vladimir. Western Europe served as a safe haven for Russian revolutionaries, but they were not safe from the Okrana's ever-present peepers. Alexander III died from nephritis in November of 1894. As the revolutionaries plotted and operated both at home and abroad, figures like Leo Tolstoy and Vladimir Lenin became known to the authorities. Lenin distributed subversive propaganda and authored works such as the workers' cause and the development of capitalism in Russia. Despite their subversive content, the new Tsar, Nicholas II, tolerated their work partly because the communists didn't employ terror tactics for now. Marxist groups like the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party and the Socialist Revolutionary Party emerged in the early 1900s. Social Democrats appealed to urban factory workers, and the social revolutionaries sought the rural population. The Okrana stalked both of them like a tiger. In 1905, factory workers, peasants, and educated Russians got pissed by Russia's defeat to Japan and protested for better working conditions. The government responded with a massacre. A lost war and violent crackdowns exposed the Tsar's shriveled dick for what it was. It didn't help that three of six interior ministers were killed over a five-year period, and they were targeted because these ministers were top law enforcement officers. Shit was crazy, and the Okrana chief, Sergei Zubatov, needed to do something. Modern policing techniques were introduced, including provocation 
manipulation techniques, creating fake trade unions to monitor labor sentiment and steer people away from violent revolutionary groups. This approach was different from American industry's response to labor strikes during the same years. And I can't help but wonder if corporations suspected Okrana agents were shaping the views of their workforce. In 1902, a student named Stepan Balmashov disguised himself as an assistant to meet with Interior Minister Dmitry Sepagin. He approached the minister with a letter that just said, sentence of execution, before pulling out a gun and giving the office a new paint job. Vacheslav von Pleve succeeded Stepagin's dead ass and treated both moderate and extremist groups with equal prejudice, considering them all, quote, terrorist soup. Despite early setbacks, Chief Zubatov expanded the use of false organizations carrying the ruse so far as to helping injured factory workers receive compensation with Okrana money. However, one of Zubatov's police-created labor movements backfired, leading to widespread strikes. He was discredited, removed from his position, and placed under police surveillance, until he snacked on a bullet in 1917 upon learning of the Tsar's abdication. The Okrana's roster read like a Scorsese film. Yevno Azov was a double-deal mastermind who infiltrated the Socialist Revolutionary Party and manipulated both sides. This turned out to be quite lucrative for him. He even orchestrated assassinations while maintaining a veneer of loyalty to the revolutionaries. Azov had a direct hand in sending Minister von Pleve to the Almighty like a new Lego set in pieces. I can understand why he did this because von Pleve was a raging anti-Semite who organized pogroms and Azef was Jewish. Anti-Semitism was rampant in the Russian Empire to deflect blame from the Tsar's incompetence. The controversial Protocols of the Elders of Zion may have been written by an Okrana agent, Peter Rechkovsky. Joseph Stalin was accused of being an Okrana agent, but so far no concrete evidence exists to support that claim, though he had motives to collaborate with the Okrana for personal gain and power. Father Georg Gigapon, an Orthodox priest, led an Okrana-backed workers' union in St. Petersburg and was involved in the Bloody Sunday Massacre on January 9th, 1905. Thousands of workers gathered to present the Tsar with a petition for better working conditions, but the Tsar was off beating his meat somewhere. Troops at the Winter Palace had permission to open fire, resulting in thousands of casualties. It was still open season for interior ministers, and the Okrana faced internal divisions and leadership change. Tsar Nicholas agreed to quote-unquote give up some power and form the state Duma. The St. Petersburg Soviet also emerged under the leadership of Leon Trotsky. The Okrana struggled with agents openly revealing their identities and feared losing control to radical groups like the violent maximalists, a faction of the socialist revolutionaries. Under the leadership of Alexander Gerasimov, the Okrana expanded espionage. Between 1907 and 1909, the government made use of extensive executions and military courts, sentencing thousands to death, hanged on mobile gallows, or executed by firing squad. Many more more were imprisoned or exiled to Siberia. This was the closest to a reign of terror the Tsar ever achieved. The Okrana, of course, infiltrated the Bolsheviks, but considered them less of a threat because the Bolsheviks weren't as violent, and they viewed Lenin as weak because of his desire for a Bolshevik-only coalition. Roman Malinovsky, a double agent for the Okrana, passed information to the secret police on both the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. He even became a deputy in the state Duma and had leadership roles in the Bolshevik party. That's commitment right there. During World War I, the Okrana were less interested in revolutionaries and focused more on counter-espionage against German spies. At first, the war made Russians more patriotic and support Nicholas, even revolutionaries, because to them, the Germans were the greater of two evils. The Germans recognized they could exploit revolutionary sentiments and undermine the Tsar, so they provided clandestine support to revolutionary movements, including the Bolsheviks. One thing led to another, and now cats that look like Hitler are a meme. Meanwhile, Tsarina Alexandra and Tsar Nicholas had a bloody problem, literally. Their only son and heir to the throne, Tsarevich Alexei, inherited hemophilia, a rare blood disorder where minor injuries result in severe bleeding. The Tsarina turned to Rasputin, a Siberian mystic who initially appeared to alleviate Alexei's condition, probably because he made the actual doctor stop giving the kid aspirin. He got lucky on that one. Rasputin's proximity to the Romanovs, especially Alexandra, raised suspicions within various circles, including the Okrana. So Rasputin was subject to police surveillance. Rasputin's scandalous behavior fueled rumors that he gave the Tsarina her 
her own therapeutic regimen while Tsar Kukulis was busy losing another war. Rasputin was assassinated in 1916, and I'd be doing us all a disservice if we didn't talk about his ding-dong. Supposedly, the Mad Monk's 12-inch meat was preserved in a jar of formaldehyde at the St. Petersburg Erotica Museum, but it may or may not be Rasputin's actual wizarding wand. According to an article in The Cult of Weird, one of the first objects in a jar alleged to be Rasputin's dick was actually a sea cucumber. The Erotica Museum's owner, Dr. Igor Kinyazkin, purchased the jar and its contents in the year 2000 for $8,000 or over 13 grand today. How much would you pay for good dick? Why the cost though? Well, Rasputin's tallywhacker developed sort of a cult following. This gets pretty insane, so I can't stress enough that this is legend, not necessarily historical fact. As the story goes, in the 1920s, Rasputin's daughter, Maria, discovered a group of women in Paris who worshipped Rasputin's ballistic missile. They believed looking at it could cure impotence and supposedly handed out pieces of it like over-the-counter Viagra. How traumatizing for poor Maria to discover this fan club. Then, allegedly, the manhood of the traveling Raspinus was cut off and used by a cult during sacred rituals. Then Rasputin's daughter Maria obtained it, which is so cringe, but she needed money, so supposedly she sold it. And eventually, the Tsarina's favorite royal scepter landed at the Erotica Museum. The guy who performed Rasputin's autopsy noted that Rasputin's eggplant emoji was in fact there and intact. Dr. Kinyazkin said, quote, I'm 99% sure it's real. That's the cope that you need when spending thousands of dollars on what might be a jar of gooey duck. That's basically it. Might be the real thing, probably isn't. It might not even be a dick. But if it is a dick, and it isn't Rasputin's, whose is it? We don't know if Rasputin was an Okrana agent, but he played a role in the monarchy's demise. In March 1917, after days of rioting in Petrograd, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated the throne, bringing an end to over 300 years of Romanov rule. The provincial government, which had appointed new ministers from the state Duma brought some sense of stability. The Okhrana disbanded at the demands of the Petrograd Soviet, resulting in agents going underground or abroad. The provincial government assessed the Okhrana's effectiveness, unearthing scandals related to agents like Azef, Melanovsky, and others. Former agents disclosed their involvement in assassinations, worker strikes, and fanning the flames of revolution to maintain their credibility. The Okhrana also busted illegal printing press operations for generous bonuses. Then, some Okhrana Okrana agents set up their own illegal printing operations for profit. The Okrana was replaced by the Counter Espionage Bureau of the Petrograd Military District. The chaos paved the way for Lenin's Bolsheviks to seize power and establish the Soviet Union. That's basically it for this video. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Agents dismissed.